Tonight, snowbound in Sydney. The latest storm leaves drivers stuck and some CBR Ram roads impassable. Out of the woods, heavy snow is forcing wildlife onto roads and highways. And bad romance. On this Valentine's Day, we'll hear some tales of those who were unlucky at finding love online. Our nor'easter is departing, but lingering flurries and gusty winds tonight and into Thursday. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. Cape Breton is digging out once again after a second winter storm in less than two weeks. Another 20 to 40 centimeters fell from this latest system, and that's on top of the historic 150 centimeters last week. As Nicholas Sagan reports, the accumulation, blowing snow, and clogged roads are making it tough to get around. Streets blanketed in snow once again. Cape Bretoners woke up this morning to what looked like a blizzard. And through the day, that brought more shoveling. We love winter, but this is a lot of snow all at once. Shepard had to climb through his basement window because a snow drift had blown against his front door. And he wasn't the only one snowed in. Team Rubicon, a veteran-led volunteer disaster relief group, has been digging themselves out before they can help anyone else. People don't get it, especially if you're not local. We're talking six, eight, nine feet snow drifts. They've been waiting to get the go ahead that it's safe to hit the roads. Sonia hopes it isn't too long because their work can mean the difference between life and death. Should there be a, a medical emergency, uh, if we have to take 10 minutes, 20 minutes to shovel somebody out, even though we could deploy a team in time, that's 10 minutes of somebody's life that we could potentially be wasting. And the snow is holding up emergency response as well, since many highways and side roads still aren't clear. Police are warning people to avoid travel as they've dealt with several vehicles stranded in the streets. This Mountie says he's never seen worse conditions in a 16-year career. I've worked all through the mountains of BC on some of the craziest highways um, anywhere. And this tops them all. The last couple of weeks, I have never in my life ever worked in conditions like this. Just getting to work has become such a monumental task for not just me, but all first responders. The municipality says they're working on it with 170 vehicles. Our fleet of equipment is running at full capacity and has been for the past couple of weeks. And as the plows work around the clock, Cape Bretoners will as well. Neighbors helping neighbors, trying to dig out once again and hoping for a sunny day. Nicholas Sagan, CBC News, Sydney. The storm also swept through Halifax last night, leaving many to dig out this morning. Schools were closed throughout H HRM and government offices had delayed openings as plows worked on the cleanup. And although the total snowfall amount from the past week is nowhere near as much as Cape Breton, getting around proved difficult for some. It's like usually it's seven to eight minutes walk, but on the snowfall, it's like 15 to 20 minutes easily or more than 20 minutes. Are you tired of the snow yet? <laughs> yeah, I am. It was bad, like everything is unplowed, but yeah, I guess it is what it is. They, they said it was going to be 10 to 15, but I think we got a bit more. So it's gonna be a long morning yeah. of show. Yeah, lots of shoveling to do. Mm -hmm. At least it was lighter snow. Yes, on the upside. still probably some sore backs and tired muscles, <laughs> but a little sure. lighter. Yeah, fluffier snow this time around, no question. That led to more blowing and drifting snow, though, Tom and Amy. Uh, thank you so much. And really, that's kind of the, the theme moving forward as well, is with the winds that are going to be relentless tonight, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour and gusting upwards of 50 kilometers per hour and even 60 in some coastal areas. Uh, that's really going to be the story tonight and throughout the day tomorrow as well, especially in the northeast where we are again looking at uh, some additional snowfall, uh, most likely here, of course, where we have a winter storm warning in effect for Inverness County south and north. Uh, this is the area here, most likely to see additional totals in the 20 to 25 centimeter range, especially in the highlands. Uh, but again, you can see these flurries continuing right now for Cape Breton wrapping in on the back side of this system. Uh, some of those are going to edge down towards the Halifax area of the valley. We're all going to get a little taste of flurries tonight, but as this uh, nor'easter pulls away, its impacts on us will be a little bit less and less over the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. So there's the storm departing. There's that round tonight. 
we will see some light snow and flurries continuing again, particularly for Inverness and along that Northumberland shore, but edging down towards Halifax and even as far west as Yarmouth, we'll see those flurries tonight. Now for Thursday, it really is the Northumberland shore and Inverness County in particular, but even for the Sydney area, some light additional accumulation is possible. So this is additional totals tonight and Thursday, and you can see where the bullseye here five to as much as 15 centimeters, uh, basically from Cumberland County, Colchester, Tatamagush, all the way up to Anaganish, and then of course for Inverness County. That's again likely going to be our bullseye for additional snowfall. Sydney, possible for another five centimeters or so, but for the most part we're done and it is the blowing snow to contend with. Thursday evening now, picking things up, few lingering flurries in Cape Breton. There's the Alberta Clipper we've been talking about for the last couple of days. It will be sailing to our south perhaps clipping the southwest with some light snow and flurries, then it's gone and a quieter weekend. Thankfully shaping up as we move into the Saturday time period and Sunday time period. This coastal low looks set thankfully to sail <laughs> well to the south, Tom and Amy. So, that is good uh, news. Some good news there. Mm. No one happier than you about that, Ryan. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> right about that. Okay, thanks, thanks Ryan. So much. Thank you. Well, some of the tenants who were displaced from a provincially owned residence in Sydney after a propane explosion are returning. The Nova Scotia Provincial Housing Authority says of the 59 tenants, 42 have returned and more will continue to move back into the Silver Birch Manor over the next few days. The explosion, which resulted in the death of a 73-year-old woman, occurred due to heavy snow sliding off the roof and striking a propane tank line. Tenants in two units are being offered accommodations in other properties. Mountains of snow are making it difficult to get around Cape Breton, of course, and it's not only challenging for people. Wild animals are also struggling. That's why many more of them are showing up on our roads. Aaron Potty explains. People online are sharing pictures and videos of animals walking in the middle of plowed roads. Like humans, they're finding it difficult to navigate after record-breaking snowfall last week. Lyle Donovan is EMO coordinator for Victoria County. We don't want to hurt the wildlife, but first and foremost, we, would, we, would, uh, we don't want anybody to get hurt or injured or damage any vehicles or anything like that. So. Donovan encountered a mother moose and possibly her baby last week. He says the pair were exhausted, and it's not just large animals making their way onto roadways. Like uh, coyotes, I've I've seen encounter it myself, uh, but I'm hearing from other uh, people around the municipality as well. They're they're encountering wildlife as well. So, the snowbanks are making it difficult for animals to cross into the woods and for drivers to see around those snowbanks. Department of Natural Resources in Cape Breton says drivers should take caution and be aware that deer and moose are most active at dusk and dawn. And even simple things as making sure that your vehicle is winter ready, um, that it has good quality tires that are properly inflated can actually help um, with your like ability to stop properly. Natural Resources says to also note that deer often travel in herds and to remember that moose will sometimes chase vehicles. Walsh says it's important for drivers to maintain a safe distance. Erin Potty, CBC News, Sydney. Volunteers at the tent encampment on the Cobbleton ball field in HRM say several people have left their tents for shelter elsewhere recently. Matt Taylor of the nonprofit group Gated Community Association says there are 13 people at the encampment now, down from the peak of 54 residents back in the fall as the city's eviction deadline looms. The reaction from the residents uh, was obviously a lot of shock. It did come sort of uh, very quickly. There was not really a pre-warning, um, but um, they're sort of taking it in their stride. There are some people that we still don't know where they're gonna be going right now, but we're working very hard. Uh, we really need some more partnerships to open up and help out these guys all over with uh, maybe some hotel rooms until more uh, permanent shelters become available. I'll talk to Matt Taylor about the situation at the Cobbleton ball field encampment and what he would like the city to do with its eviction deadline. That's our newsmaker interview just after 6.30. The provincial government is planning to spend roughly what it has the past two years on capital projects. 
The capital plan it released today has about $1.6 billion worth of projects, including road work, new schools, college residences and hospital improvements. For the first time in decades, the province will also be spending money on new public housing units. The PCs have promised to build 222 new units over the next five years. That number has been called inadequate to meet the demand. But Finance Minister Alan McMaster had this response to the criticism. We're doing what we are doing and we're always looking to do more. Um, and with respect to could we do more public housing, um, maybe. But we're also, uh, we feel the, what we did announce was significant. And we also acknowledge, as I've said before, with this capital plan that uh, there, there are sometimes limits to what the marketplace can produce. McMaster also highlighted the fact the Department of Health is getting close to $600 million again this year for capital investments, which includes money for more design and prep work to support the QE2 redevelopment project in Halifax. There's no money yet for actual construction on the site. A large roof fall in the Donkin coal mine last July was a near miss for those working underground. Documents released under a Freedom of Information request show miners passed through that part of the tunnel just 90 minutes before the rock ceiling collapsed. The collapse resulted in a stop work order. The province lifted the stop work order in December, but mine operator Cameron Cole still has not resumed production. The province has said the company needs an independent engineer's report on its safety plans if it wants to keep operating past the end of this month. The Nova Scotia Supreme Court has backed a police review board uh, ruling rather, to dismiss a complaint about racial profiling. The ruling stems back to an incident in July of 2020. Kayla Borden, a black woman, was driving home when she was stopped by police, arrested and put in handcuffs. Officers mistakenly thought she had been another driver who fled from police earlier in the evening. Borden was under arrest for less than a minute when another officer arrived and told them she was not the suspect. Borden was looking for the police review board to discipline the two officers in her arrest, but her complaint was dismissed. We have more tonight on the federal government's plan to cancel the maritime elver fishery this year. In Ottawa, bureaucrats in charge were grilled over the proposal and closer to home, the commercial industry and Indigenous leaders are reacting. Paul Withers continues his coverage. Horror stories about this fishery are legion among legal harvesters. My fishermen had seen violence and been victim of violence in the elver fishery. Uh, it happened in 2021 when they were kidnapped and uh, forcibly moved to another area. There was death threat. Yesterday, the department acknowledged it cannot manage the fishery, the minister's intentions repeated by a deputy. To share her view that it is not possible to have a safe and sustainable elver fishery in 2024, and therefore the fishery should not be opened. The admission greeted with scorn by conservatives. This is a disgrace. How could you possibly let this happen? How does taking legal harvesters off the river help stop the poaching? The deputy told a parliamentary committee this closure, the third in four years, will prevent mixing or laundering of legal and illegal catch. This year, all of the harvest will be illegal. We will be out in full force. The department needs more time, she says, for regulations that will require a license to possess elvers throughout the supply chain. Tories are not the only skeptics. Um, I'd like to see, you know, examples made because that'll send a far, far stronger signal to the community than new regulations, etc., which they will ignore anyway because there's just simply too much money to be made. The tiny translucent eels sell for $5,000 a kilogram and are shipped live to China and grown for food. Many of the unauthorized harvesters are Indigenous, claiming they are exercising a treaty right that does not require government permission. Commercial license holders say DFO enforcement has been woefully inadequate. The shutdown will affect eight commercial license holders and their employees. Now that's going to put 200 fishing, commercial fishing families out of work. Meanwhile, eight Nova Scotia bands had submitted their own plans for an elver fishery this year and accused DFO of acting in bad faith, saying, we provided them with a proposal that reflects our inherent rights as Mi'kmaq and included actions for promoting responsible resource management. 
DFO says it will make a final decision on the season in coming weeks. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. Riverside Lobster in Mategan will not reopen. Champlain Seafoods has announced the permanent closure of the lobster processing facility. Operations were shut down in October due to low catch landings. The company says a small number of employees are still working there and will continue to work to wind down operations. Along with the 80 local workers, the plant usually hired 70 more temporary foreign workers during peak times. The workers will be offered employment at other Champlain Seafood facilities. Well, it is Valentine's Day, the day of love. But many know that the road to love never runs smoothly, if it runs at all. <laughs> People who came to a roaring romance event in New Glasgow share their stories of ill-fated online dating attempts. Have a look. of the New Glasgow Rotary Club, so they're celebrating a 1920s themed dance. What's, dating, what's the dating scene like in Paris? It's a lot of that same thing where you're like, you meet somebody from school and then, you know, it's just the small circle of friends. Yeah, there was about half a dozen uh, high schools in the area, so you kind of just, you, you meet through friends and it's the way you went, so. Yeah. Challenges of dating when you're in a smaller community. Less options, Less you options. know everybody. Yeah, everyone knows everyone's dirty laundry. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone's dated everyone, so it's very hard to, yeah. you know, meet someone new because you already know things about them that maybe you shouldn't. So. <laughs> yeah. We're all Tinder, but like, it's very hard to take Tinder seriously yeah. because yeah. it's hard to know, like, for one, if people are like actually being truthful about like themselves, there's so much like editing out there and like lying on the internet, it's hard to know if people are being authentic. Yeah. Meeting somebody online, you're not actually meeting them. It's just like a text exchange. So then you have to actually go meet them and that's like such a drag to me. I don't know. Hmm. Sounds like it's tough out there. It sounds like it. Nice nod to Valentine's Day today, well, by know. the way. You're I, I do what I can. Sporting the colors. <laughs> First quick break on the way. Stay with us. Yes, there is a lot more to come on CBC Nova Scotia News. Ride-hailing drivers and other gig workers aren't feeling the love this Valentine's Day and have staged an international strike. And the Kansas City Chiefs' Super Bowl victory parade was marred by violence today. Reports say several people were injured after gunshots were heard at the celebration. And we've got Ryan up next with his weather forecast. We'll see you in just a few minutes.
At one point last night, you could barely see down the street. The snow was coming down so heavily. Big oh, fluffy know. flakes. I know. Driving home at 11:30 last night, I, I think I was in some of the thick of it in Halifax. It, it was yeah. pretty heavy. It was pouring snow, mm -hmm. and we don't use that phrase uh, quite often, but uh, it was really intense and. That obviously, uh, those few hours really made a huge difference mm -hmm. in terms of overall totals. And uh, here they are, and you can see that Atlantic coastline, 20 to 35 centimeters uh, to 40 uh, along that Atlantic coast. Spanish Ship Bay stands out. It is a 52 there. And across uh, Richmond and Cape Breton counties, 25 to 40 centimeters there, uh, roughly. And again, uh, we're looking at additional totals now for uh, places like Anaganish and Picto and into Inverness. These are totals as of this afternoon. But the Atlantic coast was so much focused the last few days. Is it going to go north? Is it going to go mm -hmm. south? Mm -hmm. And right. uh, really, uh, the track wasn't all that bad, but uh, what the models underdid was the intensity of this main snow band that really set up last night. And again, you can see that moisture pouring in from the Atlantic with this system that was rapidly strengthening. And so there was a lot of moisture there and a lot of strength, a lot of uplift. So this snowfall band was dropping three to five, even up to seven centimeters mm. an hour. Wow, that's a lot. And you can see the timeline. This is 8.30 last night, parked over Halifax for hours, then finally started to move out around you know midnight. Mm -hmm. And that's when it really set up shop over the east and into Cape Breton and Sydney in particular. And yeah, obviously uh, that really added up totals there. So uh, winter storm warnings are still in effect for Richmond County and into, uh, sorry, in for Inverness County south and north uh, from Port Hawkesbury to Port Hood and all the way up to uh, the north through Shadow Camp. Now those winter storm warnings will likely continue tonight and even into tomorrow morning uh, with those northwesterly winds not going anywhere, creating that blowing snow, also aiding to the onshore flurries, which are going to continue to blow in and the risk of some uh, locally, or locally higher intense squalls as well. And you can see there's the radar there now, and that is streaming in there along that Inverness County area in particular and across into Cape Breton. Not too much being picked up by the radar here right now further to the south and west, but we will be seeing, I think, that pick up in intensity for you folks along the Northumberland shore tonight. And that is the storm, which is bringing 40 to 60 centimeters, likely every bit of 50 to 60 centimeters for a good chunk of the northeast coast of Newfoundland over the next uh, couple of days. There's the area of high pressure that's moving in. There's the clipper we're watching for Friday, and here's how it will all time out. Temperatures tonight ranging between minus 5 and minus 7. Uh, minus 3 to minus 5 for Cape Breton. Temperatures will actually tick up a little bit towards morning and then fall again uh, as the temperatures, uh, the air mass is wrapping around this system. Uh, you can see the winds. We're going to show you the gusts here are going to be quite gusty along the Northumberland shore and Cape Breton, and I think this is where we'll, things will be the most intense is late evening into the early overnight here along the Northumberland shore into Cape Breton. Chance for flurries darting down into the Annapolis Valley and Halifax as well. Quieter towards tomorrow morning, no question. Yarmouth, Tri-County area is still gusting to 60. Halifax as well, gusting upwards of 70 though for a good chunk of the day and maybe even 80 along the coast for Cape Breton tomorrow afternoon. And again, this is where we're going to see our best chance of some additional flurries. And as I mentioned earlier, 5 to 15 centimeters. Most of that tonight, I think, 5 to 10 tonight, and then another 2 to 5, say, throughout the day tomorrow along that Northumberland Strait. And we are looking at... Yeah, another uh, greater chance of another 5 to 10 for you folks tomorrow for Inverness County. And this is where, again, the winds are going to be howling with those gusts. Blowing snow is going to be an issue, no question. Sydney looking at maybe another 5 centimeters. Not a whole lot more of accumulation there, thankfully. Minus 2 to minus 3 for the Northumberland Shore. Uh, for you folks tomorrow, winds gusting again at least to 60, if not 70, along uh, parts of exposed areas of the coast. 0 to minus 2 uh, for the Fondian Valley region, and we'll start to see some sun breaking in here uh, for you folks in the west. Yarmouth and then into Kedji and Bridgewater and eventually into the Halifax area. Looks like we should see uh, some sunshine for tomorrow as well. Friday clouding up for everybody. Uh, maybe a break or two of sun towards the Cape Breton region. Cloudier and the better chance for flurries here in through the southwest as this clipper moves just to our south. Maybe some light accumulation, Shelburne County, Yarmouth County, but uh, not looking at much here. Uh, hopefully enough to handle with the broom. And then by the time we get to Friday evening, that is done. The weekend. 
And yes, once again, I mean, hard to thread the needle and get some sunshine, although uh, we did time that out last weekend, but it uh, looks like Saturday will be rather cloudy. This coastal system, thankfully, looks set to sail to our south, though we'll maybe see a few flurries on the backside of that on Sunday. No temperatures, certainly cooler this weekend and then trending up towards the freezing mark uh, for Monday and back into the sunshine uh, for mid next week. Tom and Amy. Things looking up, don't you yes, think? Yeah, I think for so. Sure. <laughs> okay, Ryan, thanks so much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Well, after their annual general meetings this past weekend, the PCs and Liberals are starting to line up their priorities and messaging. And with the MDP on the road hearing from Nova Scotians, what's clear is that all three are entering a pre-election phase. Here is Jean Laroche and Michael Gorman. John, this past weekend, both the Liberals and Tories held their annual general meetings, and we saw what I think is the most concrete indication so far that these parties have turned their minds to the next provincial election. Absolutely, and we know the on paper that next election is supposed to happen uh, in mid-July 2025, but if uh, history is any indication, we've seen in other jurisdictions, premiers have pulled the trigger before their fixed election date. The most explicit electioneering we saw on the weekend was from the Liberals. Zach Churchill announced that a Liberal government would reduce the HST in the province from 15% to 13%. They would also index income tax brackets to the rate of inflation. The Tories, meanwhile, did a lot of talk about election planning, election readiness. They announced their co-chairs for the upcoming election campaign. But the subtext is there. They're thinking about it, too. What's interesting with what the Tories did this weekend is it really uh, shifted some focus away from health care. Still their priority, but over to education and uh, shortening the period uh, the, that it, that'll take to go from an undergrad degree uh, to become a teacher. It's probably the most focused piece of education policy we've seen from the Tories so far. This idea that you will now be able to apply for an education program with only two years of undergraduate study as opposed to a bachelor's degree. We'll see how this plays out. There's already some feedback rolling in, but clearly, as you say, they're starting to broaden their field of view. Our population is growing. We know that it will continue to grow. It will grow more. So um, we'll be doing that work to, to understand uh, the workforce um, requirements. But, but we know that this is important work now, um, not only to create a pathway for folks who want to become teachers who are in Nova Scotia and um, getting a Nova Scotia education, but, but just to make sure that it's clean and clear um, for anyone who's interested. And when it comes to the NDP, we've seen Claudia Chender talk about the need uh, for uh, more uh, public housing, uh, the need uh, for uh, people to get more, uh, keep more money in their pockets. And so they too, like the Liberals, are kind of looking at affordability as one of the key election issues uh, in that next election. And it's, you know, the NDP didn't have a, a meeting this past weekend, but Claudia Chender is out on something of a road tour, taking her around the province carrying this message around, presumably looking for feedback to build strategy. And it's a safe bet that all of these messages from all three parties are going to get road tested when MLAs return to the legislature at the end of the month. And we'll get a good indication in that upcoming session of what the uh, government's priorities are for the next 12 months because we will see a budget. Uh, if it looks like a pre-election budget with plenty of spending and goodies, well, although hard to imagine that a government could spend more than they have in the past couple of years, but it'll give us a, a hint at what's to come, at least in the short term. All right, thanks, guys. Up next, I'll talk with a volunteer at the tent encampment at the Cobequid Ball Field about the city's looming eviction of tenters there. That's our Newsmaker interview. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News.
Volunteers at the tent encampment on the Cabaquid ball field in HRM say several people have left their tents for shelter elsewhere recently as the city eviction deadline later this month looms. Matt Taylor is with the nonprofit group called the Gated Community Association, which is helping to support a group of tenters at the Cobbequit Road ball field. Uh, Mr. Taylor, what kind of progress are you having with people moving on from the tents? Well, it's been quite a frantic week uh, since the announcements, but um, we are happy to say that we are making some headway. Uh, I mean, going back to the peak of summer into fall, we had 54 residents. Our current count right now is uh, 13. Well, that is a significant drop. Where are those people going? Um, well, recently we've had, um, we've had some hotels uh, open up for us um, in conjunction with uh, like Adsum and Briny House. Um, we have had some of the shelters like Phoenix Shelter and Beacon House have also uh, opened up some extra beds and some extra pods. So uh, this week we've had two, indiv two individuals go to hotels. Um, we've had two new uh, people go into pods up at Beacon House along with the resident that was already there. Uh, we had another lady a week or so ago relocated to the warming center for Beacon House. Um, so yeah, gradually we're working with the, uh, with the province and we're working with HRM and uh, we're trying to get people in out of the cold rather than just a temporary fix. Yeah, you're getting people on the move, it sounds like there. So what has the reaction been to the, the city's uh, eviction notice? Uh, the reaction from the residents uh, was obviously a lot of shock. It did come sort of uh, very quickly. There was not really a pre-warning. Um, but um, they're sort of taking it in their stride. There are some people that we still don't know where they're going to be going right now, but we're working very hard. Uh, we really need some more partnerships to open up and help out these guys all over with uh, maybe some hotel rooms until more mm. uh, permanent shelters become available. I mean, it's all well and good temporary shelters opening up, but what happens in six months time when they end their temporary shelter, where do those guys go then? Where and are you, are you hearing from anyone there in the encampment who is steadfastly refusing to leave? No, we don't have anybody in our encampment steadfastly refusing to leave. We have some okay. people that have really grown attached. Um, we have a, a diverse uh, needs group of people here. So we have some people that are really struggling with it because this has become their home. You know, and we also have some people that can't wait to get a pallet shelter or a pod and get out of a tent. So, you know, it's a, it's a mixed reaction, but, you know, we're meeting the residents where they're at and we're, you know, doing it on an individual basis. And we're really trying to continue our support that we show for them with their personal and professional development. And, um, you know, we're hoping that we're going to be able to carry on supporting these individuals, even when they've left the field, wherever they're at. And, uh, well, the, yeah. yeah, there was there was that housing report yesterday that that called the uh, the tent encampments a crisis uh, to be urgently dealt with by all levels of government and to do it with some dignity for the tenters. Is that happening in Halifax right now? Do you think I can't speak for the other encampments right now, uh, even though we do help out other encampments like with supplies and advice. We have so much to do here that we're um, not really having the time of day to go around and visit them all on a regular basis, but from our point of view, um, I would say the people are liaising with us pretty well right now uh, to help us. I've, I've been on the phone most of the afternoon trying to find a place for a particular resident with disabilities, and we actually managed to find him a permanent bed this afternoon, and one of my colleagues has just taken him there now as we speak. So um, the one thing that we are finding very confusing here, to be completely honest is, is the fact that some people that lose their spots or get kicked out or whatever are still getting dropped off here and yet you know there's an eviction notice mm. so how does that work you know we 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 don't want to be responsible for any extra people when we're trying to find shelter for the people that are already here and then some people are getting dropped off and just add into our numbers so it's you know it's hard to navigate but we're trying our best and just quickly before I let you go, you mentioned the pallet homes there. They're not ready yet. Do you want HRM to hold off on evicting tenters until those pallet homes are up and running? 
Well, that would be ideal, yes. I mean, there was a slight delay because of weather and stuff with the delivery. The pallet homes are actually coming together really well. Um, I visit most days to see what the uh, how they're getting on, and it is uh, they are coming together. They were hooking up some electric and uh, water stuff yesterday for the uh, toilets and showers. Um, but yet again, we still not are guaranteed how many of our guys are going to get a pallet shelter out there. It's uh, it's done on a um, on their own system, so um, we know that there's a very very high percentage that we're getting probably four or five people from here up there, and we've also pushing for a bunch more. So I said, if we get what we want to get, we're only going to be left with about six or seven people here that currently have nowhere. So that's our next challenge. Well, good to get the update. Uh, Matt Taylor, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thanks for your time, Tom. Coming up, NATO defense ministers are in Belgium to discuss the possible next steps in military support for Ukraine.
Welcome back. The Kansas City Chiefs victory parade was marred by violence today. Several people were shot where thousands had gathered to celebrate the team's recent Super Bowl win. It's unclear how many people were hit, but preliminary reports put the number at one dead and between 10 and 15 injured. Police rushed to the scene near Union Station with guns drawn and helped some of the victims who were taken away in ambulances. Police in Kansas City say they have detained two armed suspects. 800 law enforcement officers were on hand for the event today. NATO defense ministers gathered in Brussels to discuss the next phase of military support for Ukraine. And during the summit, Canada announced $60 million in aid for Ukraine. It comes after Donald Trump's controversial remarks. He suggested member countries who don't pay enough for defense should not get NATO protection. The CBC's Briar Stewart has more from London. This is the Cesar Kunikov, a Russian landing ship capable of carrying hundreds of troops and armored vehicles. A ship Ukraine says it destroyed overnight in a drone attack. The Kremlin would not comment on those claims, but it appears to be the latest strike on Russia's Black Sea fleet, one area where Ukraine is having some success. As NATO ministers meet to talk about how to better support its military and the alliance. This year, I expect 18 allies to spend 2% of the GDP on defense. That is another record number. The renewed talk of spending was in part a response to this. To be an American. On the weekend, Donald Trump suggested that NATO members who don't spend enough of their GDP on defense should fend for themselves, adding he would even encourage Russia to attack them. You don't pay your bills, you get no protection. It's very simple. Canada is near the bottom of the list when it comes to meeting NATO's spending targets. It invested less than 1.4 percent of its GDP in defence last year. But in Brussels, Defence Minister Bill Blair announced another $60 million to train Ukrainian pilots to fly F-16 fighter jets. I think we need to judge our, our allies, and particularly for Canada, the United States, on its long history and track record of, of being there uh, for global peace. Defence experts say what the war in Ukraine has shown is that NATO countries need to step up their military production. To fill in the holes in the road, you know, the many weaknesses of readiness, such as stockpiles and ammunition and spare parts that the Ukraine war has, sh has shown up. Ukraine says it's so short of ammunition it has started rationing. A multi-billion dollar aid package which would supply more has passed through the U.S. Senate, but it's still hung up in the Republican-controlled House. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Ride-hailing drivers and other gig workers say they're not feeling the love this Valentine's Day and they have staged an international strike. They're off the job in the U.K., U.S. and Canada. They're calling for better wages and better working protections. Worker protections, rather. The CBC's Anise Hadari has the story. Many of the people who drive you around or deliver your food in cars or on bikes say they aren't happy with how much they get paid these days. You do the math without tips and it's a, it, they're paying you nine, ten, eight dollars an hour. Um, it's hard work. You're outside in the in the cold and the in the in all kinds of weather, and they should respect that. I think the company should respect that. Less pay and more mileage. We have to drive a lot for this one. Like we have to spend two hours for one delivery, or two, you know, like traffic in Toronto. So like two hours, I'm driving for three or four. $4. In many North American cities, drivers protested over concerns like not getting paid when they aren't actively driving. But this economist points out wages aren't as simple as with other jobs. Uber drivers, they have to pay for their car. They have to pay for their insurance. So perhaps the way in which we use to come up, the, come up with the minimum wage isn't actually the same formula that we should be using to come up with a minimum wage for these workers. Now, what that formula is, I don't think we have an answer to that yet. Uber said it believes most of its drivers are satisfied and that it doesn't expect these protests to affect prices or availability. The company's stock price hit a record high today with increasing returns to shareholders. Also going up, the number of Canadians working for ride-hailing apps. Statistics Canada said 135,000 people did that last year, an increase of more than 48 percent. Dozens of those people may have been protesting today. As for their wages, 
No indication they'll be going up yet. Anise Hedari, CBC News, Calgary. Many of the world's migratory birds and fish could soon disappear from the skies and seas, according to a new landmark report from the United Nations. The research indicates which species are most at risk and why. And Ed Rom has the details. This is where we study uh, bird migration. To see just what migratory birds have to go through, here at Western University, they get them moving. About 80% of the Canadian bird fauna is migratory. They do amazing physiological feats. They'll fly all night long, maybe 12 hours without stopping. The challenges these birds and other migratory species face are the focus of a landmark UN report, covering nearly 1,200 species of birds, mammals, insects, and fish. One in five of those is threatened with extinction. And for fish, it's even worse. The main problem at sea, say experts, human exploitation. Hunting, uh, taking for food, taking for sport, taking for sale. And then the second type of, of impact or threat is bycatch or, or un, unintended or incidental capture. In other words, fish are being killed even when they aren't the target. For birds, necessary pit stops along the way used to be safe. Now, more are shrinking and toxic. They're flying north during the spring migration directly through the agricultural activities of spring seeding, spring spraying. The value, say experts, of these animals freely moving is what they bring across different ecosystems. Salmon, when they migrate upstream into these, you know, nutrient poor areas, they bring nutrients from the ocean with them. There's pest control, like, you know, what would our, what would our forests be like without migratory birds? Part of a complex engine and losing these moving parts could destroy ecosystems that ultimately help humans and animals thrive. Anand Ram, CBC News, London, Ontario. A Vancouver man has taken up an unconventional hobby as a way to work through the grief after the death of his son in the UK. He found coffin making helped him cope with his loss after he was unable to help with the funeral preparations. It's only in the living room because I moved it out of the porch. I had two coffins in my porch for five years and my dear wife, who doesn't quite share my interest in coffins, said one day, Philip! <laughs> That's enough, they have to go. I'm Philip Thompson, I'm a regular family guy. I do woodworking. I'm also a commissioner. I can tell you about why I started making coffins. When I was in Canada, I received the news from England that my son had died. Uh, he was 20. Nathan Paul Thompson is his name. And uh, it was traumatizing for the whole family. By the time I got uh, to England for the funeral, everything had been arranged, so I had no part in it. A week later, ten days later, I was back in Canada on my grief journey. Long story short, I thought, I still need to do something for Nathan. I just came to, uh, to this realization that people who are losing loved ones would love to have a coffin that was made locally. Perhaps they know the coffin maker and they can participate. I really felt strongly that was the missing word for me. I could not participate in the planning of my own son's funeral because of the distance. And so when I designed this coffin, I designed it with big screws on the corners that you physically can handle yourself. And that's a strong participation in the process of putting a, your loved one in a coffin and of sealing it. I think this is the fourth one. And um, the first two were sold to a funeral director in, in Victoria. And the third one was sold to a, a lady because she wants to use that coffin to talk about her own end of life to her family. And this is the final one I have to sell now. And it's come time to sell it for me because I think uh, my own story of uh, bereavement, uh, losing my son at an early age, has now rolled on to a point where I can let this coffin go. I've worked through my grief and love.
with my hands. I'm sure the cleanup continues, certainly in mm. Cape Breton where they have had their problems for sure, but even around Halifax here as well. Oh, it's been a lot of work for a lot of people. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And just when one ended, of course, uh, into another one. So this has been uh, an incredible 10 day stretch or so. Uh, and of course, we'll be adding up some of the numbers and how this compares uh, to others in sure. the next few days. But uh, first and foremost, let's get to our viewer picture of the day. And yes, we are going to zoom in on Ingram Port and of course on this day of love. Uh -huh. Perfect, isn't it? That's pretty beautiful. Yes, nice. Just for you, Tom and Amy. Oh gosh, thanks I th so I much. I think that me. goes out to a woman named Eva as well. Oh, you think yeah, so? I, oh, yeah. I think okay. so. Yep. All right, oh, Jeffrey okay. Ferguson, uh, thank you for sharing uh, to, with us. Uh, no matter uh, who that was, heart was for, we'll take <laughs> it. Uh, we will uh, see again additional snowfall, only a trace down in Ingram Port in Halifax. Uh, to as much as uh, a couple of centimeters. The further north and east you go, the better chance we'll get into the, those snowfall totals in the range of 5 to 10, even 15 centimeters. Inverness County, better chance of seeing 20 tonight into Thursday. 
and we will see again those northwest winds gusting 50, 60, even 70 kilometers per hour, especially through the north and east with temperatures ranging between minus 3 and minus 1, though those temperatures will tick down a little bit tomorrow afternoon in the north and east. Friday, clouds, flurries, even some light bands of snow, possibly Yarmouth and Shelburne counties, but overall that system is going to be swinging to our south. So there's the little wave tonight. Uh, we see a bit of a clear out for Thursday night into Friday, and there's that clipper that will move to our south, and that won't be impacting us too much, which is great. And then we're keeping an eye on that coastal system, but it looks to sail harmlessly to our south. And a weekend yes. off for Ryan. Yes, <laughs> we nice, hope so, yeah. All right, with well, Valentine's Day here, people's thoughts are turning to romance, of course, and to romance gone wrong. If you're haunted by an ex, you may be interested in a promotional <laughs> program launched by a pet adoption center in New Jersey. Yes, it's called Neuter Your Ex. For a $50 donation, the center will name a feral cat after your former flame, and then the animal will get spayed or neutered. <laughs> the program, which is meant to reduce the feral cat population in the area, has made an impact. Okay, good motivation there, I guess. <laughs> we know that because there are now many four-legged Jeffs, Mikes, Ians, and Tylers roaming the area. There's even one cat named Gaslight Gee. <laughs> but if you're hoping to fully uh, humiliate <laughs> your ex, there is uh, some uh, disappointing news. Mm. The center will not give the cats okay. surnames. That's probably okay. a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah. probably for the best. That's it for us tonight. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.